So welcome again to another uh, talk about the Dhamma. Uh, just looking at the, the video here, it's got all the, the people upstairs and oh, it's just full of ghosts, but I've seen somebody walking now. <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> so this evening's Dhamma talk is supposed to be entitled um, Life is not what it seems, seeing things as they truly are. And actually on the subject of ghosts, do you understand that a lot of times that you look upon a person and you think it's a person and sometimes it's a ghost? Real ghosts, you can't recognize exactly who they are. They're not what they seem. In fact, the person sitting next to you could be. <laughs> Life is not what it seems, but you're safe in this place. I can tell a story to start off this little Dharma discourse. It's a confession I made some years ago when I was a monk. Because I told this, uh, it was a few, well, maybe about five or ten years ago. Did you remember there's all these scandals about Thai monks, especially having affairs and stuff like that? And I thought one evening at my center in Perth, I thought it was about time that I made my confession. I told everybody that some years previously I'd spent some of the happiest hours of my life, some of the most beautiful times in the loving arms of another man's wife. We kissed. We did. We kissed. She hugged me. Some of the happiest times in my life in the arms of another man's wife. When I said that, some of the people in my audience said, Oh no, not Ajahn Brahm as well. I thought he was such a good monk. And some of them were even going out to the door. And they never want to come and listen to these. There's going with another man's wife, that's adultery. And then I told people, that woman, who I love very much, I still love her, that woman in whose arms I spent some of the most wonderful hours of my life. She was another man's wife. She was my father's wife. It was my mother. <laughs> I spent some of the happiest hours of my life when I was a babe, when I was a young boy, in the arms of another man's wife, my mum. She kissed me, we hugged, and I still love her to this day. <laughs> now the... The reason I tell that story, some of you have heard it before, if you didn't hear it before, you think, oh my goodness, Ajab Brahm is a naughty monk. <laughs> and this is a trouble because sometimes life is not what it seems. Sometimes we only hear half of the, what's being said and the rest we make up by ourselves. We think, oh, oh that's adultery. How often is it that somebody has said something and done something and has been quite innocent? And then you look at it afterwards and think, oh my God, look at that. They've done something terribly, terribly wrong. As a monk, I have to be very careful. One of the most embarrassing times of my life, and not my fault at all, I was teaching in a prison in the, to the south of Perth in a town called Bunbury. And uh, the only way to get down there was on a public transport which got to the town in the mid-afternoon and I had to wait for about three or four hours to get a lift to the prison for the evening. So in the afternoon, this one evening, I decided to go and meditate on the beach. It was such an, a beautiful beach. It was very quiet. No one was around. So I just went there, found a nice quiet spot, sat down, closed my eyes, and went into meditation. Nice peaceful meditation, maybe for an hour or more, maybe an hour and a half. When I opened my eyes, I realized there was someone sitting to my left and another person sitting to my right. When I opened my eyes, now I'm a monk, I was very shocked because to my left was this beautiful young girl in a bikini. <laughs> and another one on my right. 
I'm very glad that no one took a photograph. <laughs> I would never have been able to explain that. <laughs> what had happened that day was the last day of the school exams, pre-university exams. The local high school had finished their exams, so the school was finished. They decided it was a nice afternoon, let's go to the beach and celebrate. So they changed into their bathers and the girls into their bikinis. And these two girls, they were 17 years of age and very pretty, they decided there's a monk on the beach. (laughs) And they wanted to talk about meditation, about Buddhism, completely um, noble aspirations. But their dress sense was not really... (laughs) 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 And so... They were very respectful. They didn't want to disturb my meditation, so they just sat one on either side of me to wait. I don't know how long they waited, but <laughs> as soon as they were there, sort of I made a quick dash for it. <laughs> but the thing is that sometimes things are not what they seem. It was completely innocent on all parties. They just wanted to you know, understand Dharma. They didn't really know, you know how you should be dressed in front of a monk. And I was just meditating to know anything which was going on. So it's quite innocent. But sometimes we jump to conclusions and things are not what they seem. And this is called delusion. It's too often we're deluded. Somebody comes up to us. Maybe somebody in the office say, Oh, thank you for coming early today. And you think, what do you want? <laughs> because you've got negativity. Any kind thing, any nice thing, any wonderful thing they say, you always interpret it in the worst possible way because they're your enemy. Any, it may be somebody you really like and you see them, like, might be like a, uh, like a girlfriend. You see them pick their nose. Oh, it's so cute the way they do that. <laughs> the point is no matter how gross it is, If you see it in a good way or in a a loving way, everything looks beautiful. So the point is that delusion is what bends the world to suit us. We only see what we want to see and we don't see what we don't like to see. There's been many, many experiments done in psychology concerning the way We only see just a part of what's happening there. One of the interesting experiments which was done at Princeton University recently. One of the psychologists went up to a student and they behaved as if they were just visitors to the campus. So they went up and asked which is the way to the chemistry department. And before the student could answer Two workmen went right between them with a big door. Very rude, but never mind. And once they passed through the two of them, the psychologist asked the question again, which way to the chemistry labs? And the student said, oh, over there. Now what had actually happened though, when the door went past them, which was another two psychologists, coming behind the door hidden from view was another psychologist. When they were, the door was between the questioner and the student, the one coming with the door stopped, the one who first asked the question went with the door and disappeared. They'd actually swapped the questioner. And they wanted to find out whether the student had noticed that the per- first person who asked the question was a boy, but the second person who asked the question was a girl, to see whether they noticed or not. And they swapped around the first questioner and the second questioner. And about 99% of the time, the student didn't even recognize. The first questioner was a small white male and the second one was this big black girl. (laughs) And the reason is because when that student was being asked a question, the only important thing was the question, not the person asking it. So their perception only registered what was important to them, the question, and they were literally blind to the person asking the question. So they could change the person asking the question. As long as the question remained the same, the perception was that was the same person. Fascinating 
how we don't see what's really there. We only see what we expect to see, what we want to see, what we need to see, and no more. No wonder we are deluded, even when you change from moment to moment, because it's the same person asking this, or it's the same question you're asking, which is, when am I, getting, when am I going to see that limiter? <laughs> you think it's the same person, but you are changing every moment. Now do you understand the illusion of a continual self? So, very often we have this delusion of not seeing things as they truly are. Have you ever got angry with somebody? Have you ever really hated them? Have you ever thought that that person is such a pig, such a dog, they don't deserve to live? Have you ever got angry at people like that? And have you ever been just so surprised when you see that that person who's just a pig, a dog, doesn't deserve to live, they're so mean and cruel and selfish and insensitive, when you find out other people love them. If you hate someone, it's quite surprising, it's a shock that other people love them. You think, how can anybody love such a pig, such a dog like that? But they do, and they think they're such a wonderful person. Look at me, you think, oh, Ajahn Brahm is such a wonderful person. Like, Ajahn Brahm? Oh, he's so awful. He takes away all of our people from, from the church and takes them to the Buddhist center. <laughs> he's so awful. He takes our nice sons who are doing really well in their university and we want them to marry a nice girl. He makes them into a monk. <laughs> <laughs> There's <laughs> two of my monks in my monastery are brothers. They're the only two sons, the only two children of this German couple. The mother doesn't like me at all. <laughs> he says, bad enough, Ajahn Brahm takes one of my sons, but both, can't he leave me with one? <laughs> so the point is that some people who you think are just so awful, how can anyone love them? They, people do love them. And some people, you know, you think, the hatred. Is there hatred in them? Is there love in them? Or is there hatred in you? Or the love in you? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Delusion says the hatred is in them. You're the cause of my hatred. And because if you really think the cause is in them, then everybody should hate them. Or sometimes the sort of the love, the causes in you, you're such a lovable person, or you're so nice and so wonderful, everybody must love you. But no, the cause of love, the cause of hatred is not in the person out there, it's in you. The same as in suffering. Once one of our monks in Thailand was having a very hard time, and Ajahn Chah went up to him and said, is the monastery suffering or are you suffering? He had to admit it. it's not the monastery, because sometimes I like the monastery, sometimes I hate it. So it can't be with the monastery, it must be me. So now this delusion is always to think it's somebody else's fault. Your suffering is not your husband's fault. There was once, when I was going down the road in Perth, I was on a, a, a highway, a two-lane highway, Two lanes on either side. We came to the red traffic light. The car, it was a hot day, so we had the windows down. The car next to us had just stopped. And I was in the passenger seat. I looked into the neighboring car. And this man was shouting and cursing at the traffic lights. You stupid traffic lights. Didn't you know I was late for an appointment? And you turn red. You always do this to me. <laughs> do you think it was a traffic light's fault? I can imagine him later on doing the same thing to his wife. You stupid wife, there you go again. It's not the wife's fault. It's just wives are just being wives, that's all. Traffic lights are just being traffic lights. It's not your wife's fault when you get upset at her. It's not your husband's fault when you get upset at him. He's just being a husband, that's all. Just like a traffic light. Sometimes you'd like that. If you don't believe me, swap your husband, you'll find it's exactly the same. 
<laughs> no, don't do that. I get into trouble with all this <laughs> advice. <laughs> so, the point is there that our delusion sees things in the wrong way. We don't see things as they truly are, as they're real. We sort of put the problem out there rather than here. As I've said to you meditators, if there's a sound which you think is disturbing your meditation, it's not that the sound disturbs you, that's delusion. You disturb the sound. You disturb life. That's why it's suffering. Life just goes on. So, the whole point of seeing things as they truly are is just seeing like husbands as they truly are, wives as they truly are, children as they truly are, teenagers as they truly are. What do you expect of teenagers? Do you always expect them to do what they're told? Did you do what you were told? (laughs) Sometimes you did, but most teenagers don't do what they're told. So it's part of being a teenager, it's part of growing up, it's part of being a wife, a husband. When you get old, it's just part of being old, that's all. Have you ever noticed, just when you really get old, some of the old people really get cranky. It's just part of getting old, that's all. I noticed this. I did an investigation, a study of old people. I found out an important thing. When you get old, your eyes get very weak. You have to wear glasses. When you get old, your ears start to go. You have to hear hearing aids. When you get old, you know, your, your hands shake, your legs are very weak. When you get old, so much of you gets weaker and weaker. But there's one part of old people which always gets stronger. It's their mouth. (laughs) My goodness, can old people talk? (laughs) And that's why, I'm getting into trouble here, that's why most politicians only start in the political life when they get old. (laughs) I don't think I'll get into trouble there. Now, (laughs) so this is, when we understand the way things truly are, if we only had that wisdom to know what life is, we know it's a waste of time trying to change things. Most suffering comes from not seeing the way things are truly are and wanting it to be different. It's Ajahn Chah, again, summed it up very quickly. He said there was a man who had a chicken and he was very, very upset because he wanted the chicken to be a duck. And he went to the monk and said, why isn't my chicken a duck? And (laughs) he's stupid. Chickens are chickens, ducks are ducks. You get a headache wanting your chicken to be a duck. (laughs) But that's what life is, isn't it? We want chickens to be ducks. We want ducks to be chickens. We want our husband to be just so kind and gentle, just like Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> if he was so kind and gentle, he wouldn't be your husband, he'd be a monk. <laughs> you can't want chickens to be ducks. And you don't want your wife just to be so kind and caring and always be there for you. No, it's chickens and ducks, that's all it is. So... <laughs> we want things which can never be. We want to live a long, happy life. But you can't do that. This is the human realm. This is not the heaven realm. In the human realm, people have greed, hatred, and delusion. There's fights. This is the human realm. This is what it happens here. If there wasn't any fights, if everyone lived in peace and harmony, this would not be the human realm anymore, this would be heaven. But take it from me, this is not heaven. (laughs) So we have to accept these things sometimes. We're only going to live for so long and then we're going to die. Sometimes people are kept on coming up to me and saying, Ajahn Bob, may you have long life, may you have long life. Oh my goodness. (laughs) You're so cruel. (laughs) <laughs> so <laughs> instead of saying that you should just may you be happy and well and that's enough forget the long life business <laughs> so 
Some people want to be beautiful. And they don't want to get ugly. That's why people have all of these uh, facelifts. They have, what's it, extreme makeovers, I think the word is these days. They have dyed their hair. They don't just allow things to just take their natural course. My goodness, that's a lot of suffering. (laughs) So instead of doing that, why not just get old gracefully? Just allow the hair to go grey. Allow everything to sag. (laughs) 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 Maybe you're more at peace. This is life. But the point is, because we're not wise, we want things to be different. We don't allow nature to do its thing. We always fight nature. And when we fight, fight, fight nature, we don't accept nature. Sometimes we do get old before our time. Sometimes we die before our time. Are you too young to die? No one is too young to die. You can die at any time. That's part of life. Sometimes, though, a child dies. And most times people think, why is that? Why does someone, maybe six or seven, ten years of age, have to die? Many years ago, a monk told a story. He was staying in a jungle, in a forest. In that jungle, he had a small hut, just made out of bamboo and thatch. A very simple dwelling. He'd meditate there all day, sleep there in the night. It was a very quiet, peaceful place. But one evening, there was a terrible storm. Very violent winds and lashing rain. And in the middle of the night it got so strong that first of all many branches came down and whole trees were uprooted by the storm. Now the trees in the jungle are very big and very heavy. And he was very scared because if one tree, even if the edge of the tree hit his hut, it's only bamboo and thatch, it would have no protection at all. His hut would get squashed and he within it would also get squashed. So he's very afraid. And sure enough, very often, trees came crashing down to the ground. But they always seemed to miss him. In the morning, he got up out of his hut, because in the morning, it's really strange, I don't know what the meteorological uh, reason for this is, but most storms, they stop around dawn, or just beforehand. And dawn is usually nice and peaceful. So he got up, when the storm had abated, he looked around, and many trees had come very close to clipping his hut and ending his life. But what took his attention, rather than the trees and the branches which were taken down the night before, were the leaves which had been ripped off the tree of life by the storm. As you would expect, most of the leaves lying on the floor were old brown leaves. The leaves which had lived their life on the tree, and now lay dead and scattered on the ground. Among those old brown leaves, he noticed a few yellow leaves, and even some green leaves, young leaves, and even some fresh green leaves, which were of that colour, he knew they would have probably only sprouted from the bud maybe the day before. There was also a few of those lay on the forest floor. Straight away he got an insight. But he wanted to check first of all. He looked up to see what leaves were left, still alive on the branches and twigs of the forest trees. As he expected, most of the leaves still up there were the green leaves, the strong, vigorous leaves which had withstood the storm. But he smiled when he saw that even though many green leaves and very young green leaves had been torn off the tree of life, he saw there were still a few old curly brown leaves still clinging on. He said, ah, that's nature. It's the same with human beings. When the storm of death comes through our communities, it usually rips off the old brown leaves. I'm looking around and there's quite a few old brown leaves. (laughs) 
but it also takes off some yellow leaves and some green leaves as well. When the storm of death comes through our community, sometimes it takes the young green leaves as well, only freshly sprouted, the babies and young children. Only a few, but they too get ripped off the tree of life. Even though young people die, there are still some curly old brown leaves which cling on year after year after year. He realized that's called nature, that's Dhamma. He realized there's nothing going wrong when young people die and old people keep on going. He said this is the nature of life and death. When he understood the way things are, the truth of nature, understanding cause and effect if you like, never again did he feel that there was something wrong when a young person died. Even a baby died. He understood why. The same reason why when a storm blows, young green leaves fall off while old brown leaves still stay on. The same reason why young people die and old people carry on living. So from that time on, because he understood the nature of things, there was never any more suffering when a young person died. This is called seeing things as they truly are, not as we want them to be. If the world went as it we wanted it to be, all the young people would keep alive. And the old people, especially when their mouths got very strong, then they'd die. <laughs> but life doesn't go the way we want it to. Life goes according to its own nature. And it's seeing that nature of life is what wisdom truly is. Now in this evening's discourse, I'm not just talking about daily life, I'm talking about the deeper parts of life as well. Because in this retreat I've been talking about not just samatha but also wisdom as well. Because many of you have been doing a lot of insight meditation without realizing it. Every time you've been meditating, you've been learning how to let go, how to be at peace. What's actually happened when you've been meditating? Many of you have been trying hard and getting just frustrated. And I told you, just relax, let it go, and you found things are being peaceful. You're learning about the second noble truth. You're getting insight to what it means that craving is the cause of suffering. Some of you have been quite surprised. You've just been sitting there just saying, this is good enough, this is good enough, and not trying at all. And then incredible, powerful nimittas come up. You say, I didn't do anything, and then I got all this happiness. Correct, that's called the third noble truth. Letting go gets you to Nibbana, at least close to Nibbana. You're getting insight into the four noble truths, not by thinking about it, not by listening to Dharma teachers, not by looking in the books and writing an essay about these things. You're getting insight through your own experience of putting these things into practice. You see what happens. It's incredible sometimes that it's so easy to meditate when you know how to let go. But when you crave, it's just so hard. Oh, you get so sore. In the beginning of this retreat, I told you, sleep as much as you want. Take it easy. You think, oh, I can't do that. If I sleep a lot, then I'll get even worse. Some of you have taken my advice. Some of you have said in interviews you've slept more in the first three days than you've ever slept you know, for a week sometimes. But now you feel so good and so peaceful. You see this letting go, relaxation actually works. You're finding out what you're doing, what works, what creates peace and happiness. Some of you get stuck in your meditation. You get to a certain point and you can't get any further. Every time you get stuck in your meditation, it's wonderful. <coughs> Which is why when you've come to see me and you say, I've got stuck, I say, oh, wonderful, good. And I, I'm not just saying that to be encouraging. There's a deeper meaning. Now, I want to say that deeper meaning now. Because when you get stuck, you're coming across what we call an attachment. 
An attachment is an obstacle to letting go. It's a barrier to peace. Now you're understanding what these attachments are. Why can't you go deeper in meditation? It's because you're attached to something, that's why. Even the beginning, when you start thinking about this and thinking about that. Why are you thinking? You've got nothing to think about in this retreat. You don't have to think about the lunch, it just comes, it just appears. You don't have to think about breakfast, seven o'clock, and there it is, all in front of you. You don't even have to pay for it. <coughs> you don't have to think about answering the telephone, you don't have to think about cleaning your house, you don't have to think about your children, who knows where they are. You don't have to think about your husband, I wonder what he's up to. <laughs> you don't have to think about anything. So why do you think? I'll tell you why you think. Because you are attached to thinking. You just don't know what to do without your thinking. <laughs> You're so used to the thinking that when it disappears you go, Ah! I want my thinking back. <laughs> That's what we call attachment. You can't let it go. Now it's okay to think about this. That's more attachment. Well, here you're actually practicing it. And some of you have let go of these things. Some of you have let go of thought. And it's so lovely and peaceful. You think, why can't I do that all the time? All this thinking business. I let someone else do the thinking. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you had a computer which did all the thinking? And all you need to do is actually to say, okay, here's my jobs for today. You think it all out. And you can just do nothing like a thinking machine. <laughs> Sometimes I told some meditators in Singapore, if you can't stop your thinking, you can imagine it's like this. Imagine that last night, when you were asleep, these two little demons came to see you. One crawled into your left ear hole, and the other one crawled into your right ear hole. And these two little demons are now having a conversation inside your head. That's called thought. <laughs> so, tell those two demons to shut up because they're not you they're not important leave it alone why can't we do this is because we're attached to thinking you know you've abandoned that attachment or put it down temporarily when it's peaceful when it stops here you're getting the insight into thinking an attachment you're having a test, an exam. If you pass that exam and get peaceful, you can stop the thinking, then you know what attachment to thinking is. Because you can put it down. That's a test. You go deeper into meditation. Your body starts to disappear. Why is it when people, their hands disappear, their feet disappear, why do they get afraid? Ah, my body's disappearing. I'll tell you why you get afraid. It's because you're attached to your body. Listen, when you die, it's going to all disappear. This is a test for you again. Meditation is the rehearsal for your death. It's true, because your body disappears. If you get fear when your body disappears, why is that? Because you're attached to your body. Now you're understanding what attachment truly is. Why are you attached to this body? Why are you attached to this body, especially those of you who are old and ugly? <laughs> you can imagine if you're really young and pretty, okay, be attached to that body, but even then, but you know, I can't see many of you like that here. <laughs> Why can you let go of this body? It's such a pain, this body. Think about it. Observe it. It's always itching. If it's not itching, it has to be taken to the toilet. If it hasn't need to get taken to the toilet, you've got to put something in the other end. You've got to lay it down, you've got to scratch it, you've got to wash it, you've got to comb it. Oh my goodness. This body is so demanding. So why can't we just throw this body away in meditation? Say, okay, you can look after it. I'm going to go away. I'm going to have a rest. If you think your husband is always a pain, if you think your wife is always nag, 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 
actually that, I don't know if I told this, but um, I know that some people when their wives go on retreat they get lonely without you, the husbands. That's why sometimes it's hard because they're attached to you. That's why if you go on a retreat and they sort of, they don't like you going on a retreat because they're lonely, what you should do is make a tape for them, a CD, what I call a nagging tape. Get on the CD, go nag, 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 nag. And tell them, if you miss me, darling, play the nagging tape. <laughs> and the same for the husband. If the husband's going on a retreat and the wife misses you, get a moaning tape. Moan about the finance. Moan about how much the wife is spending. Moan about how much the kids are spending. <laughs> then you won't miss them then. So have a moaning tape for your body. Just how much does this body take up your time? Oh, it's so painful. It's, even when you put it to bed at night, it's never comfortable. You have to keep moving it this way and that way. And it doesn't get easier the longer you live. You get more aches and pains. For those of you who are getting old, and that's everyone over 20, <laughs> you're all over the hill. And you all know that the, when you go over the hill, the more over the hill you go, the faster you start to descend. <laughs> So, why can't we let go of this body and just detach from it? My goodness, it's wonderful when this body is let go of. You're just so free. All of you who have experienced a body disappearing in meditation, it's so nice. You're understanding what attachment to the body is. It's so nice when it disappears. You're also understanding what attachment to the senses are. Why is it that you always listen to what's going on around you? Someone has a conversation. You start thinking, are they, thinking, are they talking about me? They're not talking about me. What are they talking about? I want to listen to this. What's actually happening here? We're so attached to our senses. Sometimes this happens in meditation. We get so peaceful. We're nice and comfortable. And we get a bit afraid. Wonder, I wonder what's going on down by the knee. You actually send your attention down there to see what's going on. Let's check out on the, the feet. Let's check out on the back. You can't leave it alone. You're attached to the body. You disturb it. When my knee starts to disturb me, I think of it like a telephone. Like some of me ringing up on a mobile. Hey, it's a knee here calling. Delete. <laughs> Sometimes the back. Hey, it's a back here I'm making. Delete. Turn it off straight away. If you turn off your mobile phone, it's like turning off your mind to the feeling of the body. You don't care about the body. You can look after itself. Actually, it does a much better job of looking after itself when you don't get involved. So detach from the body. Your body will be fine. Detach from the five senses. You don't need to see, hear, smell, taste, touch. And what happens then? You get these beautiful nimittas, these wonderful, peaceful states of mind. You know what attachment is. You know what happens when you let go. When all these attachments, you understand what attachments are really like. They're like having this rucksack on the back with all these rocks in that rucksack. You've got so many attachments, so many burdens, so many heavy weights. No wonder you suffer. Having one body is enough. Somebody wants two bodies. They go and get married. They've got another body to worry about. And then sometimes they have three bodies. I'm not talking about children, I'm talking about mistresses, you stupid men. <laughs> Is a one wife suffering enough? And you want another one? Oh my goodness, that's really ignorance. <laughs> so it's true. Having one body to care about is enough, so leave it all alone. You know the three rings of marriage? What's the first ring of marriage? The engagement ring, the second ring of marriage, the wedding ring, the third ring of marriage, suffering, yeah. <laughs> the three rings of marriage. Okay, so be careful. And you know what the fourth ring of marriage is when you get a, 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 um, a mistress? It's a ring from the divorce lawyer. <laughs> the telephone ring. <laughs> the telephone ring is the fourth ring when you get a mistress from the divorce lawyer. Now anyway, back to this body. When you start to let go of this body and its five senses, it's peaceful, it's bliss. 
When you get into that nimity, you're just right on the edge of jhana. It's almost like a halfway house, like a, a portal, like a doorway into the jhana. Halfway house, like a, a portal, like a doorway into the jhana. When you actually get into that jhana, you're really blissed out. And the best experience you could ever have. What's that got to do with insight? I'll tell you what it has to do with insight. When you come out from those powerful deep experiences, which I was talking about yesterday, last night, you can never forget those. They are such strong experiences. In my little book, I, I, I describe them like traumas. Like if you've had a bad experience, like being abused, have an accident, uh, and some terrible disease, you can never forget that pain. Because it's so intense. Now this is like a trauma, these jhanas, but with the opposite sense, they're entirely positive. But they are so strong, they leave an imprint in your mind which you can never forget. But a positive imprint. Which is why that when you come out of those jhanas, it's almost impossible not to look back and say, what was that? And also, why was that? What happened and why? Why was that the most wonderful experience? Also, because you want to get back there again, so you want to find out how to get back in there. (coughs) When you come out and you look at them, you find some amazing insights. You understand, as I was saying yesterday, why the Buddha said that this body is suffering. It's not so much attachment to this body as suffering. Attachment stops your experience of jhanas. But it's the body itself and the five senses is dukkha. Sometimes when I say that, people say, how can you say that? Have you never seen a beautiful sunset over the ocean? Have you never seen your first child being born? Have you never felt the bliss of falling in love? I'm a monk. Somebody once asked me, somebody once asked me, did you become a monk because you had a relationship with a girl which didn't work out? <laughs> did you become a monk to forget? I said, no, no, I didn't. That's not the reason I became a monk. See, you've forgotten. <laughs> Come on, think about it. Did you become a monk to forget? I said, no, no, no. Because I said, no, it's obvious I have forgotten. <laughs> Okay, I'll leave you with that one. That's a Zen ko, and you have to think about that for another day or two before you get the joke. (laughs) But, even like seeing or hearing like a marvelous symphony, all of that, everything which you think is the most wonderful pleasure and the delightful thing in this world, the bliss of jhana exceeds all of that. That's why in comparison to the happiness when the body and all the five senses disappear. In comparison, all of the happinesses and pleasures of these five senses are suffering. When you know something more, when you know something better, you can never be entranced, even by the most beautiful flower in the garden. Because you know there's something more, something deeper more. Once upon a time, there was a little tadpole who lived in his pond. And one day the people told him, or rather the frogs in the pond told him, about the wonders of dry land. This little tadpole did not know what they were talking about. He said, what do you mean, dry land? And he said, oh, in dry land, so there's no fish. In dry land, there's no reeds. In fact, every description of dry land was always, it's not this, it's not that. And so the little tadpole thought, oh, there can't be such a thing as dry land. It's all just speculation, it's all just fantasy. There's no such thing, because I can't feel it, I can't experience it. In just the same way, some people think, oh, Nibbana doesn't exist. Because when you ask the monks, what is Nibbana? They say the deathless, the unconditioned. The emptiness, not this, not that. They think, what are you talking about? It's a lot of old rubbish. It's like when I was a young boy. When I started getting interested in religion. When I started getting interested in spirituality, I used to ask the, the priest, the, the Christian priest in my school, what is this God business anyway? What is God? 
And they are, are to me like God is ineffable. Like God is, you can't sort of, the nameless, that which is beyond all things. That which is, is, uh, was it, to, yeah, beyond all things, like unconditioned, you can't give it a name. Beyond cause. And I thought, they don't know what they're talking about. If they can't give me a proper description of what God is, I thought such a thing doesn't exist. So that's one of the reasons why I gave up Christianity. I didn't believe them. They were all just saying what it was not. They could never tell me what it was. Trouble was, then I started getting into Buddhism. Then I asked my first monk, well, what's this Nibbana business? What's Nibbana? They said, ineffable, beyond words, (laughs) emptiness. And I said, I've heard that somewhere before. (laughs) A lot of the monks don't know what they're talking about. (laughs) Neither do you. (laughs) But, it's just like that tadpole. If you haven't left the lake, dry land, you don't know what you're talking about. And you can't, you can't describe it, you can't know it. You can actually philosophize about it. Tadpoles in the pond can write PhD theses about dry land. But it's all a lot of, lot of bunkum. But what happens is one day the little tadpole grows legs. And with those four legs, it actually climbs out of the pond. When it climbs out of the pond for the first time, it's still got some water on its back, but it can experience dry land. Ah, this is what dry land is. And the little tadpole, now a frog, gets an insight. The experience of what dry land is. An insight which it can never get as long as it's always been in the water. If you've been born in the water, grown up in the water, actually you don't even know what water is. You've got nothing to compare it with. Now, do you get the simile? You are like little tadpoles. You were born in this body, in these five senses. You've grown up with this body in five senses. You spent all your life in this body in five senses. So how can you really know what this body in five senses truly are? No more than a tadpole can know what water is. When someone talks about dry land, You think, it can't exist. But there comes a time when I trick you, or the Buddha tricks you, deceives you into letting go of all of this, and you move out of your body, out of the five senses, into the world of the jhana. Ah, that's what they mean. Now you know that the body is dukkha. Before that, I say that the body is dukkha. Say, oh, come on, Ajahn Brahm, you're just a dry old stick of a monk. You should go and get a relationship and get your emotional world alive. Oh, you've never had a, an affair. You don't know the joys of life. You haven't had any children. You should get a life. <laughs> and I said, you don't know the joys of Johnny. You should get a death. <laughs> <laughs> So, but when you understand these things, you have got what we call more data to work with. You have got more experience. And this is what happens when you get the experience of those deep states of meditation which is so different than every, whatever you've seen before. The body has gone. Your senses are no longer there. You're in a blissful state with it's just pure mind. That is going to change your perception of things. You know what the Buddha was talking about when he talked about samadhi and how that samadhi is the path. As samadhi, no samadhi is the wrong path. That's in the Anguttara Nikaya. The threes. You understand what's going on here because you have an experience which will change your life. The best bliss you've ever had. Now you know what happiness is. Now you know why people become monks and nuns. It's not a tough life. It's a blissful life. We don't do this because we're scared of relationships. We do this because we're into the bliss of jhanas. It's not, we're not negative, completely positive. A higher happiness, not abandoning happiness. So, and also you get these incredible insights into what the nature of things is. When you understand just the bliss of jhanas is much more delightful 
How ever you're going to be attached to the things of the world anymore? Why would you trade a beautiful pleasure for a lesser pleasure? You can't do it. And also you understand what suffering is. I was very careful when I gave the simile of the tadpole because the tadpole, when it grows into a frog, is still carrying some water on top of its back when it goes out into dry land. The person who's into jhana, they haven't let go of samsara completely yet. They're still carrying a little bit on their backs, but they have enough of a new experience to know what dry land is, to know what nibbana is, when all things cease. More than that, in these deep jhanas, you have other beautiful, amazing experiences. One of the other things you look back upon that experience is not only bliss and ending of suffering. Actually, the Buddha called the happiness of those jhanas he called it Sambodhi Sukha. And when I first read that, I stopped and thought, my goodness, I know what that means. Sambodhi means enlightenment. He called enlightenment, he called the jhana, even the first jhana happiness, enlightenment bliss. And I know from a fact, and I know from the suttas, it's not enlightenment, but the point was, it's so close. So close to enlightenment, the Buddha actually gave it that term the bliss of enlightenment. So if you want to know what enlightenment feels like, I'm not talking about just all this, it's not this, it's not that. Not like this of the Christian priests or the monks I first knew who were just making it up as they went along. This is actually your experience. You know Sambodhi Sukha. You've been there, you've felt it, you've known it. You know enlightenment happiness as described by the Buddha. You're getting an idea what Nibbana is. And why in the text the Buddha said, Nibbana Paramangsukha, Nibbana is the highest happiness. It's very clear what that is now, because you've got that experience. I've already mentioned yesterday that there's terms like the Pabhasara Jitta, the radiant mind. You've been to that radiant mind, you know that mind. Those nimittas are radiant. Many of you, in the interviews that come up and say, you've got that nimitta, you've seen it, and it is so brilliant, so bright, you think you're being blinded. For those of you who have said that, you'll come across a phrase in the suttas, many monks talk about this, the Pabhasava Jitta, the radiant mind. Now you can say, yeah, I know what that means, because I've seen it. Now I understand what insight is. It's experience-based. You've got the data. You see all these words. You made that connection. Ah, that's what it means. More than that, though, when you get into a second jhana, I mentioned this yesterday, one of the salient features of those second jhanas is you're absolutely still. Now, when I talk about absolutely still, I really mean absolutely. You can't be more still than in the second jhana. As far as stillness goes, second, third, fourth, all the other jhanas are exactly the same in their degree of stillness. You are immovable, like a rock, like a diamond. Now the point is, in that state, it's very strange to be still. Because you notice when you come out afterwards, my goodness, that was so still, what was missing? There's something in your ordinary experience which is no longer there. Just like the frog, first time out of the pond, there's something which was always, always was around it, called water, is now long, no longer there. What happens for the frog is that what's missing is the water, the second jhana. What's missing is something we call the will. You. So often we identify, we think we are the one in control. We are the driver. I am the one who decided to come here tonight. I am the one who decides to scratch my, my neck. I am the one who, dis, dis, uh, you see, scratch your neck as well. I am the one who decided to put the hand in front of the mouth. I am the one who decided to say this. Are you the one in control? Are you the will? If you are, what happens to you when you're in second jhana? Because that is completely gone. There is no will left. Even the potential to do is completely absent. 
This is the best I can describe it until you get there yourself. You will understand what I mean, the potential to do when it disappears. You've never experienced that in your life before. A completely new experience for you. Even now, you may not decide to do anything, but you're always in charge there. If you want to leave, you can leave at any time. If you want to move your hand, you can do it at any time. If you want to think, you can think. You think you really assume you're in complete control. That potential to do is so close to the illusion of self, to what you take yourself to be, that it's scary when that disappears. In fact, one of the things which we protect is our independence. And what does independence mean? Our independence to do what we want. At least to think what we want. Which is why that most people are so scared that someone is going to take over your mind and control you. Now, when you understand that's not you at all, it's a completely different understanding. Will is such an important part of you. That's half, and the major half, of the illusion of a self. When the Buddha said, there's no self, there's no one in here. This is what you experience in these deep states. That which you took to be yourself has now disappeared. It's gone. You realize it can't be you. The will can't be a self. Because there's still awareness there. Strong awareness without any will. There's an old saying. I saw this scrawled as graffiti on the walls of the philosophy department in Cambridge University when I was a student. First of all, it quoted the 17th century French philosopher René Descartes who said, to be is to do. Doing is like will. He made the connection between the will and actually being. If you don't do anything, that's a sign you're dead. That's how they find out if you're dead. They poke you and see if you do something back. That's why we say a thing is inanimate. If it doesn't do anything, it just sits there. Is your stool, is that alive or is it dead? It's not doing anything, therefore it must be dead. That's why he's saying to be is to do. The will which moves you is a sign of life, of being. To be is to do, said René Descartes. But underneath that was scrawled another French philosopher, more modern, Jean-Paul Sartre, who turned it around, instead of saying to be is to do, he wrote, no, to do is to be. Through will, you actualize your being. And that's why we have our identity in what we do in life. Who are you? I'm a monk. What does that mean? I do monk business. What are you? What are you? I'm an engineer. What does that mean, an engineer? I do engineering. You define yourself by your activity, by your will. So Jean-Paul Sartre turned it around and said, no, it's not to be is to do. He said to do is to be. And underneath all of that was a famous American philosopher who summed it all up. He was saying, to do is to be, that's wrong. To be is to do, that's also wrong. The American philosopher said, do be, do be, do. And that was Frank Sinatra. (laughs) (laughs) And that was actually written on the philosophy walls of Cambridge when I was there. And every time I get serious with deep dumb, I also have to make a joke to keep people (laughs) awake, awake and alert. But it's true, in that jhana, the doer disappears. There's no one there. That changes a lot of your life. You've got a great insight there into anatta. That's often enough to get you enlightened. There's no one in there. My goodness, if there's no one in there, where can craving be? You've all heard the Buddha teaching about non-self and emptiness. Now you're actually seeing that emptiness. It's not a word anymore. It's an experience. What about impermanence? Sometimes people don't know how impermanent impermanence is. Sometimes these experiences of deep meditation, they just shock you. 
Sometimes it's like watching your TV set. Imagine there was a TV set with six channels on. The six channels of sight channel. Channel two is hearing. Channel three is smelling. Channel four is tasting. Channel two is hearing. Channel three is smelling. Channel four is tasting. Channel five is physical touch. And channel six is the knowing channel. The six senses on your TV. Now you can see the program switch from one to the other. Actually, on the TV and the channels, there's a ghost in Perth. There's a ghost story. Nothing to do with Anatta or the Enlightenment or anything. There's a ghost in Perth. I only found out about this recently. Who likes watching the TV? Because what happens, this couple who come to our monastery, they're watching the TV, they're watching their favourite program, and the channel switches over. And they get the remote, they switch it back again. And the channel changes over again. They realise it's a ghost who likes watching the TV. And the ghost can override any remote control. If the ghost wants to watch a movie, it watches its own movie. No matter how many times you flip it over, the ghost will flip it back again. It's a ghost who likes watching the TV. I think they've got an old, it's their own TV for the ghost now, so they can watch whatever they want and the ghost can just... <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's a ghost who can watch his own TV. There's also another ghost in Perth who's, it was actually a Thai couple, devoted disciples of our monastery, and they bought a new house. The real estate agent, they don't tell you these things, but the previous owner, when they were moving the furniture out of the front door, it was such a heavy piece of furniture, the previous owner had a heart attack in front of the front door and died right there. And the ghost is still there, in front of the house. The ghost in front of the house always tries to get in, as ghosts sometimes do. And was always ringing the doorbell. You know that sometimes children ring the doorbell and run away, but this was the house, it was a very big open yard, it was very clear, it was no boys or naughty children ringing that doorbell. It was the ghost, sometimes they saw it. The ghost trying to get back into the house would always ring the doorbell. And the owner of the house, he had this wonderful idea. He said, now these doorbells, they run off batteries. What if I take the battery out of the doorbell appliance? Which he did. But that didn't stop the ghost. Ghosts carry their own electricity supply. You can still make that doorbell go ding, 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 ding. There's no batteries in it at all. Because that's another thing you find out about ghosts. They've got a own electricity supply. Now, where did I get that? I was actually on non-self somewhere. Oh, yeah, impermanence. Now, when you've got a TV with six channels, sometimes you can see one channel go to another. That's impermanence. Now you're seeing, now you're hearing, now you're thinking, now you're tasting. That's easy enough to see. Sometimes you can see the programs on one channel start to change. Now you're seeing this, now you're seeing that, now you're hearing this word, now that word. You can see up and down change, rise and fall, the change of the programs. But what happens in meditation? It's not you see the channels flip. It's not that you see the programs on one channel change. What happens in meditation, this is the best simile, You're looking there at your six senses and you see your television disappear. It vanishes completely away. It's not the channels change, the whole TV is gone. And that is not covered in the warranty. (laughs) Now that's what it's like when you get into these jhanas. It's not that the ordinary things come and go, it's something incredibly stable, which you thought was always there, is no longer there. Now you understand what impermanence is. Or it's like the old simile of seeing a lake or body of water and you take the rise and fall to be the waves on the surface. The waves go up, the waves go down. Happiness and suffering, life coming and going. You think that's impermanence, don't you? But in meditation... You see the waves on the surface, you're watching the waves go up and down, rise and fall, but then the whole body of water disappears. The lake is no longer there. Also, the land which contained and defined that lake is now also gone. 
If that happened to you, if you were watching me up on this stage and suddenly I completely disappeared, and the stage as well, you would get scared. But when you saw that actually happening, you would understand impermanence. This is what happens with deep meditation. Which is why the Buddha said, when you get those deep meditations, when you get into samasamadhi, from samadhi, you see things as they truly are. Samadhi pachiya yata bhutayana dasanam. From samadhi, you see things as they truly are. That is the cause. Things just fall off. <laughs> Thank you, the special effects man. <laughs> you see, everything is disappearing. <laughs> Now, ah, what's happening here? The things which aren't supposed to fall off, fall off. They disappear. There is nothing left. You understand that all those things you thought were stable, permanent, are no longer there. How can you hold on to anything? You can't attach anymore. Why is that? Because that which was doing the attachment, the doer, the knower, has completely disappeared. There's nothing on this end of the arm to grasp anymore. And then sometimes you think, well, what is this enlightenment anyway? There's nothing there to begin with. So how can there be anything there afterwards? The emptiness, the illusion of a permanent being is destroyed. When you see things as they truly are, it's only through samadhi. Otherwise you simply don't have enough data, no, enough experience. Just like the frog. Now you can see what dry land is. You understand what enlightenment is, what nibbana is. Which is why the Buddha did his four jhanas before he got enlightened. But not only that, not only the insight into impermanence, suffering and non-self. There are other great insights which you can get from deep meditation. And those great insights are the three insights. You know what the three insights are? It's called the Tewija, the three knowledges. Because this is actually following the Buddha's own story. When he sat under the Bodhi tree, what were the insights which he got? First insight was rebirth. Second insight was karma. And the third insight was the Four Noble Truths, enlightenment. Now sometimes we don't actually say that those are insights. The insight into reincarnation, the insight into karma. But they are so important insights, especially if you're going to be a teacher. So you understand what in, uh, rebirth is and how it works. Why? Because each one of you are probably are going to get reborn. You need to be taught what's going to happen to you when you die. So out of great compassion for you, you can actually give you a running commentary of what's going to happen. A manual. When you go to school, you get like a manual. When you go to a job, you get orientation. This is orientation for your death. <laughs> it's very rare to get that bit, bit of advice. You know it's going to happen. Sometimes before you get married, you can actually go to marriage counselling. You know, pre-marriage counselling, so you find out what it's all about. Even many, many things in life, you can actually orientate, get preparation for. Now... If you understand what rebirth is, because you can remember it, you've got your insights because of deep meditation, then you can tell people exactly what happens. Not only that, but you can actually tell people what happens to their loved ones when they die. There's so much confusion and superstition about death. And sometimes it's very hard if somebody close to you dies, if it's your father, your mother, your relation, because you've got to make the decisions. You don't know what to believe. It really should be these monks should get some decent insights actually to know exactly what happens in death from their own experience, not from the books, because so many people write books and they all write different things. It's actually why when I was a young monk, no, before I was a young monk, when I was a Buddhist, I went to this series of lectures by this Japanese monk he was visiting England. In those days, it was very rare to get a, a, a teacher come to uh, teach you Buddhism, a real like monk. 
But unfortunately, this monk couldn't speak good English. He only had a few words. But nevertheless, he went with a translator on a lecture tour of UK, giving talks about Zen Buddhism. He was very good. But on his last talk, which he gave in London, which I attended, at question time, somebody asked him the question, what do you think of Buddhism in England? He didn't need a translator for his answer. He'd learned a couple of words which were sufficient to convey his meaning. The question, what does he think of Buddhism in UK? His answer was this, books, books, books. Too many, too many, too many. Dustbin, dustbin, dustbin. (laughs) The great answer. Because there are so many books but so little experience. So, when you have experience of what happens when you die, you can actually know exactly what happens when you die. You can conduct a proper funeral. You know exactly what's going on when somebody dies. And you can tell the people who are left behind, look, he hasn't disappeared. Still around. If he's not actually hanging around in the Antrobawa, he's already gone off to a new rebirth somewhere. You have to let them go. It's not the body, that thing in the coffin over there, that's not a body, that's not a person, that's a body. It's just the four elements. Dispose of it in the most convenient and inexpensive way. You don't need to have put it in a big mausoleum. You don't need to sort of worry about Actually, instead of like burning it, because there's so many greenhouse gases emitted when you burn a body, wouldn't it be better to recycle it? They have these, it used to be in Tibet, and also in Bangkok, used to have these sky funerals. Let the birds eat the body. A wonderful way, that's called recycling. Get all these vultures coming along, you know, pecking all your stuff away. They get happy, they get fed, and it's environmentally absolutely friendly, no greenhouse gases, no taking up of like expensive land, and the birds are happy. And it's also, it's um, biologically, there's going to be, be no sort of diseases spread that way. It's a wonderful way to actually dispose of a body, give it to the birds. Wouldn't, be, wouldn't that be wonderful? Would you like that? Yeah. Or even better, just bury it under your mango tree. So you become all those mangoes. And so when the mangoes are ripe, your relations can eat you. (laughs) But it doesn't matter. The point is, it's just a body, that's all. So if you want to give your organs to other people, please do so. Give as many organs as you possibly can. Because you don't need them anymore. Other people do. It's compassion. It's great when you can have a transplant. For those people who are suffering from all these diseases, like kidney diseases. To have a transplant is such a wonderful thing. Imagine just how much happiness you're given to others. Some years ago, I was suffering from hay fever. And so I was really wondering. The only, the only thing I thought would, would, would fix it was to have a nose transplant. <laughs> and I was really serious. I thought, maybe, great, have a nose transplant, then I wouldn't have hay fever anymore. And then I sort of started thinking about it, and I thought, hang on, look, I'm a monk living in Australia, wouldn't it be a wonderful gesture of racial harmony if I got an Aboriginal nose? <laughs> they have this beautiful black nose in, in the middle of a white face. <laughs> now that's really sort of you know, flying my own colours, living it as, you know, walking the talk as they say, <laughs> and showing racial harmony. In fact, you can go further, you can have a few Chinese ears, <laughs> and maybe you can have a Red Indian, I can't, don't have there, something or other. <laughs> then you can really be multiracial. <laughs> but anyhow, let's go back to what I was saying. If you have that insight into reincarnation, you actually know what's going on. If you have the insight into the law of karma, you can actually teach people how to be good people, how to be happy. Keeping precepts is important. It's good karma. It makes you happy. Giving charity makes you happy. It's an investment. It's a much better investment than actually buying stocks and shares. These are Buddha bonds. <laughs> they always go up. <laughs> a great investment for your happiness and the happiness of others. If you build a temple like Chempaka Buddhist Lodge, it's an investment for your children. 
they can come here and learn Dhamma in the future as well. This is a wonderful way. That's why it's good karma. Forgiving other people who have hurt you. It's good karma. Being compassionate, being faithful to your wife, to your husband. is good karma. Don't waste that opportunity. Every act of generosity, keeping precepts, even meditation is good karma. Some of you yogis just simply don't realize how much good karma you've made over the last few days. When you understand the law of karma, you have done a huge amount. That's what the Buddha said. If you give a donation to a Buddha, it's not worth a sixty, a thousandth part of taking refuge in the triple gem. Which is not worth a thousandth part of keeping the five precepts. Which is not worth a thousandth part of getting a liberation of mind in meditation. So if you multiply all of that, and I was a mathematician before, that's a, a billion times offering a gift to the Buddha. For all of you who've got a deep meditation here. You could have given a billion gifts to the Buddha and you've done more. Now do you understand what karma is? Huge. So if you understand that through experience, you know what you're talking about. And you can inspire people, you can lead people into good, wholesome, beautiful ways. So these are insights which you can get. And how do you know past lives? You get into a deep meditation, ask yourself, what's my earliest memory? You can remember those past lives. I talked about that earlier. You can understand when you remember your past lives in detail, you can see why you get reborn this way. What you did in the past, all your karma, why it all happens. It becomes very clear, you've got all the data there and it's very easy to see the connections. So this is what we mean by insight. So to sum up the talk which I've given now, just by seeing things as they truly are, by being clear-sighted, you don't make these terrible mistakes of just seeing what you want to see or denying what you can't see. You become more true to life. You understand what your husband is, what your wife is. You accept them for who they are. You don't sort of expect them to be super husband or super wife. Your children, the same. You're more at peace with life. You're more at peace with the aging process. You don't have to keep worrying about spending all this money on just makeup and, and hairdos and facelifts and other lifts. And all you men, you don't have to worry about Viagra. <laughs> Stop it, you silly old men. <laughs> all these stupid things which we do to try and stop the aging process. And then also that when people die, you can actually see this is nature, let them go. Even a young person, seeing things as they truly are makes you wise, makes you peaceful. And if you can get the greater data of actually deep meditation, oh, you're enlightened. You can actually see what impermanence is, you can see what this body is, you can see what happiness is, you understand why the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths about suffering. This is suffering, let it go and get into deep meditation. You can understand what the Buddha was talking about. And also you can understand all these wonderful teachings, impermanence, non-self, they're all there for you. Very, very clear. Just as in the time of the Buddha, just now, you see things as they truly are. And you become another of the noble ones, even an arahat. Isn't that a wonderful thing to have in this world? So that's a talk this evening about seeing things as they truly are, otherwise known as insight. Okay, any questions about this evening's talk? Yes, we have a question there. Can you go over to the microphone, which is just over there? You need the exercise. Go on, off you go. Yes, sir, about donating organs. Um, it is said that after one dies, only eight hours later will the mind or the spirit leave the body. If one really does donate organs, it says it will hurt. Could you please confirm your views on it? Thank you. Okay, you're saying that it is said that eight hours after you die, only then does the spirit leave the body. It is also said by wiser people that it leaves straight away. 
people say all sorts of things and most of them should not really say these things unless they know what they're talking about. Sometimes it may say in a book which somebody writes and then people get very scared. And so it's just in case, there may be many, many books, but just in case, we might as well keep it for eight hours. People are so afraid when they're ignorant. So, but just in case, we might as well keep it for eight hours. People are so afraid when they're ignorant. So, you can take it as fact. That, if you want to find out as fact, you remember when you died. <laughs> and you have many, many times. And you'll find as soon as the death happens, you leave your body. If you really want to check this out, look at the article which was in Lancet, December 2001, I think it was. Lancet, the Journal of the British Medical Association, December 2001. I'm pretty sure it's that issue. Now, any of you who are in the medical profession know the Lancet is the oldest medical journal. It's got a great reputation. This is not some flaky new age sort of journal. To actually to get an article, a research paper in the Lancet, you have to be at the top of your, 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 your job. This particular article was, uh, uh, the main author was Professor Pim Van Lommel, L-O-M-M-E-L, I think it is, from uh, one of the teaching hospitals in the Netherlands. It was about people who have near-death experience in cardiac arrest. It was the piece of evidence, it was the research, he'd known many people reporting near-death experiences in other words, floating out of your body, being able to see everything which was going on, hear what's going on. And he wanted to find out when this happens. So his research was, when does this happen? It's very easy to actually to find out this was actually happening by asking the nurses, getting interviews and stuff like that. This was true, it happens. But you want to know when it happens. At what stage of the body dying does the stream of consciousness leave the body. What he found was not after eight hours. What he found is as soon as this cardiac arrest and brain death, as soon as the EEG and the ECG are flat, and all those instruments are on those people being uh, treated for cardiac arrest, as soon as that happens, then they leave the body. If there's still some brain activity, there's no near-death experience. It's a great piece of research. Not only did it show that you leave your body at the time when you have brain death, even though it's not true brain death, because if the brain is not active, then they can you know, uh, turn it on again within a, in a few minutes or whatever, and there's no brain, brain damage. But the brain is inactive. As soon as the brain is inactive, then you leave the body. But also, it showed that the brain was inactive, all the gizmos were on that brain, there was no activity discernible at all, consciousness was still active. He actually said, it was one of the, the uh, statements in his conclusion, that this proved that conscious activity survived clinical death. So anybody who continues to maintain that the mind is part of a brain, you can only have conscious activity when you have a functioning brain, you should read that article. Professor Pim Van Lommel has actually disproved it. He showed many cases of people who had literally the brain has been dead. The gizmos have been on that and shown there's no activity at all in any part of the brain. But conscious activity has occurred outside of the brain. Great piece of research. Yeah, so you don't have to wait till eight hours. Straight away, donate your organs. Yeah. Uh, deep meditation when you're dead. So, okay, the, the, I mentioned this because some yogis here were asking, what should I tell my husband or my wife? Because some, I might get into deep meditation now. 
And my wife might go into my room and think, oh, he's dead. Let's take his organs. And I'm not dead. I'm just in meditation. So the difference, which I mentioned last night, if you're in deep meditation, you're still warm. You're still heating your body. All the other life indicators are gone. And this is only in very deep meditation. Again, I only know, no, actually, I know a couple of people have done this. But only one person who actually got taken to hospital. So that's the difference. Tell your husband or your wife, and all you medics here, all you doctors, it should be in the doctor's journals. If somebody, a meditator, is taken to hospital because they look like they're dead, feel their body, make sure it's warm. If it's not warm, then straight down the morgue, fine. Yep. Okay, you were said by a meditation teacher, if you don't have good parameters or the spiritual qualities, you won't get an imitator, you can't get into deep meditation. Yes, that is true. But it is also true that each one of you have got good parameters. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in Chimpaka Buddhist Lodge listening to this talk, would you? <laughs> or you wouldn't have been born in a human body in a time when the Dhamma of the Buddha is still so wonderful, when you can hear the greatest, deepest teachings of the Buddha, you have got good parameters. So, the doors of enlightenment are open to you. Do you want to walk in? Yeah, go on. Okay, that's a good question. If you go into jhanas, there's actually two parts to that question. Do you have to go into all the four jhanas to become enlightened? Or is the first jhana sufficient? The second part of the question is, if you get into jhanas, will you always become enlightened or not? I thought that was the second part of the question. I'm not sure if that was your question, but I'm going to add it because it's an important thing to say. The first part of the question, even first jhana, is sufficient for enlightenment. That's what the suttas say. In that simile I gave yesterday of the thousand petal lotus, by the time you get into that deep layer of the lotus, the other lotus petals, as it were, are so thin you can see right in through them to the jewel in the heart, to the emptiness. There's enough disappeared in first jhana, you can infer the rest. So sometimes people can get enlightened just with the first jhana. Obviously, if you have the second jhana, it's more likely, more easy. The third jhana is even easier. The fourth, obviously, is the easiest. The deeper, the better. But it is possible for the first jhana to become fully enlightened. Obviously, afterwards, the other jhanas become just so easy. There's nothing between you and the jhana for an enlightened one. There's no obstacles anymore, no attachments, no barriers, no niwaranas, no hindrances. It's easy. The other part of the question is more fascinating. If you've got those jhanas, will you always become enlightened? The answer obviously is no. But you are close enough. You're in the presence of Nibbana. All you need is a little bit of wisdom. A way of looking back at those things and making sense of what they mean. And that's the teaching of the Buddha. If you have a little bit of understanding of what the Buddha taught, and you have the experience of those jhanas, You'll add those two and two together, you'll get four. So it's important to have the teachings of the Buddha plus the experience and then you have the enlightenment happen. It's as if the jhanas are like the, the flame. It's as if the teachings of the Buddha are like the gunpowder. When they come together, there's a bang. And what's destroyed is your delusion. But that will come on Saturday night, the end of the journey, enlightenment coming soon in a temple near you. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions on seeing things? Yes, please. The microphone is there. It's waiting for you. Uh, I want to ask uh, whether uh, the path for enlightenment and the path for the Buddhist or Buddha to be is the same 
And the second part of the question is that if you choose the one of the path, that means you can you have to forego the other one. Okay, you're asking about the Bodhisattva path and the path to enlightenment. Now, I'm not going to answer according to the book, so I'm going to answer from experience here. So what actually happens? You might think you're walking a different path, but you're actually walking the same path. Both lead to the same goal. There's only one tip of the mountain, not two. What actually happens? It's like, for example, you may be, what's a good example? You may be uh, walking, say, was it, we're in page now. You may be walking west because you want to go to Paris. You may be walking west because you want to go to London. Doesn't matter what your destination is, you'll still reach Malacca. Am I, is my geography right? Is that west of here? Well, roughly, you know what I'm talking about anyway. <laughs> the point is that what you do as a bodhisattva, you may think that you know, this is my destination, but what is the path you tread? It's the six parameters of the bodhisattva, which is dana, sila, kanti, wiriya, samadhi, panya. That's what the practice, that's what you do on the bodhisattva path. You give generosity. I'm going to just change them. Dana, kanti, wiriya. That's generosity, perseverance or endurance and energy. And the other three are sila, samadhi, Hanya, virtue, meditation and wisdom. That's the bodhisattva path. What is the path of the arahat? Sila, samadhi, panya. Virtue, jhanas and wisdom. So you may think you're doing something different. When you get to the nitty gritty of actually what you do, you're doing exactly the same. Because both have sila, samadhi, panya. Both lead to full enlightenment. And I quote from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta where the last ordained disciple of the Buddha is something called Subhadda. Before he, uh, he was, this was in Kusinara, the Buddha was about to enter Parinibbana. This wanderer wanted to see the Buddha to ask his questions, just like you, one last question. <laughs> And Ananda said, look, the Buddha's tired, he's about to die, leave him alone. The Buddha heard and said, let him come, Ananda, let him come, Ananda. So the Buddha, even though he was on his deathbed, spoke to Subhadda. And one of the questions this wanderer said is, is a great question and a brilliant answer. He said, are there any arahats in other religions? It's a great question, isn't it? Are there any arahats, dream winners in Christianity, in Islam, in Hinduism or whatever? And the Buddha's answer was just so brilliant. He said, look, in whatever practice, path, religion, whatever you call it, wherever you find the Eightfold Path practiced, there you will find stream winners, once returners, non-returners, arahats. It does not matter what you call it. What matters is what you do. Your practice. If you practice in this way, it leads to that destination. If you practice the Eightfold Path, it has to lead in that direction. And the Eightfold Path, otherwise known as Sila Samadhi Panya. So the Buddha said, if you're practicing Sila Samadhi Panya, if you think you're a Bodhisattva or an Arahat, it all leads to the same place. Streaming once returning, non-returning Arahat. And after you're an Arahat, you don't just disappear. You teach for the happiness and well-being of others. You serve. You're not just doing this for yourself. If there's a self there, well, I want to become enlightened, you never get to enlightenment. You've all heard me say, if you want to get jhana, it becomes impossible. Whether it's a Theravada path or a Mahayana path, Bodhisattva or Arahat, it's all about letting go of the self. There can be no I in the successful practitioner. So really there's no difference between the Bodhisattva path and the Arahat path. I know other monks might argue with me, but they're the scholar monks. The practice monks will say, yeah, I understand, that's true. 
And isn't it wonderful it's true? We don't have to have all these big divisions. Mahayana, Theravada. I've started the new yana. It's called the haha yana. Because <laughs> I crack jokes. <laughs> so I practice a ha 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 That's a ha ha yana. Oh, I'm very naughty. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes, come on. Whenever, actually, I would like to ask this. Uh, what convinced you there's a rebirth? Uh? What convinced me rebirth? And Knowledge. In addition to that, <laughs> have you ever experienced a past life? Have I experienced a past life? Because I... you practice in Buddhism for so Yeah, I have. Well, okay. Now, here I've got to be careful because anyone wants to check this out, that's one of the rules I cannot actually say specifically. Because you can look that up, it's the eighth rule in the Pajitya section, a monk cannot go announcing his psychic powers and that's one of them. But all I can say, I know many monks who have remembered their past lives. So I can say that. <laughs> Okay. Next question. Any more questions? Yes, come on. Ajahn, if a person attained jhana, would he reborn uh, as a human being again? Okay, if a person attains a jhana, are they going to be reborn as a human being again? Not necessarily, because one of the figures in the time of the Buddha who got into a jhana was Devadatta. And he had psychic powers as a result. But he didn't use it in the right way. The psychic powers just led to more pride. And because of that, he started doing terrible things to the Buddha and that led to his um, going down to a hell realm. But, he obviously such spiritual power, it's only going to be down there for a while and he's going to come back again and the Buddha said he's going to be, I think he's going to be a Pacheka Buddha later on. So, you know, it's, he made a mistake there. Eventually, it's going to work. You're going to get a good rebirth. That's the exception, though. Most people, if they're going to get a jhana, you have to have great virtue, first of all. You're a pure-hearted being, and that's going to make you more pure-hearted. And if you have a little bit of good teaching, and you're not so proud that you don't listen to it, that it's going to happen that those jhanas and those wisdom are going to come together, and that's going to free you. If you're a stream winner, obviously you have to get either heavenly birth or a rebirth as a human being. So you're increasing your chances enormously for a human rebirth. And you get a human rebirth, you'll be such a spiritual pe person that you've got such a pure and powerful mind. You just really can't stay too long in the lower realms. You just don't fit down there. Either the higher heaven realms or the human realm. And if you're a human realm, you know, you're not so interested in sort of sex and material things. There's something deep inside he remembers a pleasure long ago which surpasses all of that. You'll be an unworldly human being. And because you've had a taste of that, something inside of you remembers subconsciously and you'll incline towards simple things, peace and seclusion. It leaves such a powerful imprint in the mind. You know that sometimes you can mem people remember their past lives and sometimes because of some terrible act they did, they have to keep reliving that act again and again. If you've done such a beautiful act like getting into a jhana, do you think that's going to just be ignored? That's going to become prominent in many, many lives, leading you closer to Nibbana. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now that's how a baby says, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Because obviously it remembered something a long time ago. <laughs> Any other question? Yeah. The man in you died, does it affect the process of your rebirth? And what you mean, like an accident or... Gotcha. It really depends on how you've been practicing. If you have an accident or a gunshot or something, will that really affect your rebirth? One of my disciples, she was very proud of herself because she had a car accident. 
A car rolled over as she was leaving our monastery. About three tires went over. Of course, when that happens to you, 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 know, you don't know what the damage is. So she thought she was going to die. And immediately, when the car stopped rolling, she was saying to herself, let go, let go, let go, let go. As it was, when she checked herself, there was no damage to her body, just a few bruises. The car was a write-off, but she was safe. But she was so happy, she said, I had a rehearsal and I passed the test. <laughs> so even if it was an accident, if you have been a practitioner like that, when you have a gunshot wound, it would be, let go, let go, let go, let go, let go. And then you'll have a really wonderful death. It's how you've been practicing all these years that will come up at the time of your death. <laughs> I've been practicing this a long time. <laughs> yes, go on, last question. Maybe this is the last question. We're getting late. Yeah. Yeah. His daughter. <laughs> you say you catch a grasshopper and you feed it to a bird. What happens to your karma? What's probably going to happen is you're going to probably be caught by a tiger who's going to feed it to her cubs. <laughs> okay. So I think that's enough for tonight. So thank you for coming. Let's do the sharing of merits. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Idam enyatinang ho tu sukita hon tu yatayo. Idam enyatinang ho tu sukita hon tu yatayo. Idam enyatina ho tu sukita hon tu yatayo. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Very good. There are two talks to go at night time. Friday, no one at home, Anatta, and I promise I'll be sitting here to give that talk. <laughs> it will not be given by Venerable Anatta. And on Saturday, the end of the journey, enlightenment coming on Saturday. So, see you then. Take care. Good night.